Ooh, baby, you're listening to the POW movement. Welcome to the POW movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week I have an interesting episode for you. My guest is Mode Raymond, a really stylish, often injured skier who continues to make a name for herself with her brand, her image, her skiing, and just the way she lives her life. The thing that was strange about this podcast, at least to me, is that while I did get the story I wanted to tell, I felt like Mode was waiting for me to dig up dirt on her or was waiting for me to make her sound bad, which is the last thing I want to do with these podcasts. Sure. If there is any so-called dirt out there, yes, we are going to talk about it as it's part of your life. And even if it's not positive, we still have to touch on it. But it's to get your side of the story. And I'm not trying to be an asshole about things, although I do come off that way sometimes. But with Mode, she didn't really have any of that. So there was nothing that she should have been worried about. It should have been a normal conversation about her life and times. I mean, I put in more research than normal for this one, as I'm friends with Mode's brother, the always humble Frank Raymond, and I wanted to make this one good. And it is. Mode's story is really incredible, and it's enjoyable to listen to, but it was a different experience for me, and I will leave it at that. Before we jump into the podcast, I want to ask you to please tell a friend who'd like the show about the show. Most people don't know about it, and the best way to get the show to grow is to tell someone or a large group about it. I also want to ask you to follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement. And finally, please support my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Stanley, The Ten Barrel Brewery, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Elon Skis, and Weed Maps. Now, it's time to chat with Mode Raymond. You and I, we have the exact same dog. They're super expensive, and (laughs) mine was a shocker when I found out how much my dog was going to cost. How much did your French Bulldog cost you? I was kind of lucky, to be honest. I bought him for like $3,000 Canadian, and I was kind of lucky because I did a lot of work for her. She was like, you know what, Maud? I have 16 Frenchies coming up. I will need help to create a company. So I created her logo, her name, and everything, and I straight up sold her 16 Frenchies. So they were 4 k each and even more. Dang. And nailed it. So I kind of like got fully reimbursed for him. But at five months, he did break his leg and he had to have surgery. Oh. And it cost me 3K. There you go. Dang. And have you heard of like Frenchies being so valuable that people steal them out of cars? Because that happens down here in the States. Yeah, I heard that for sure. Because Frenchies also, you know, they all have the same personality. They're so amazing and they know it's like very expensive. So, yes, I did hear that. It's pretty crazy. And speaking of being stolen out of cars, van life, given the past year, has been a little bit different with you with the whole virus and everything. But before the virus hit, van life was a big part of your life. And traveling by yourself, while it's cool to have alone time and you can gather your thoughts and you can figure out what you want to do in your life. There's also a sketchy side to it, I would think, where you're parking on the sides of the road or you're here or there. Were there any sketchy moments where you were worried for your personal life when you were living in van life? You know, like since I started my ski career, I've always been in like either a Mazda or started like traveling across the countries by myself doing like the biggest road trips solo. And I would sleep in my car or in a Subaru and vice versa. So I've been traveling for so long in my car, road tripping, and even like sometimes living out of my car because I wanted to be everywhere at the same place. So if I was living in Mammoth, I was exploring everywhere around it as well. You know, I would go to Colorado or go any places I was like close, like Tahoe and all that stuff. So I was always kind of traveling. And then the reason why I also went in the van, yes, I needed a break. But it's also because now I had a Frenchie. So I was like, you know what? I want a better uh, home for us. Therefore, I did van life and I wasn't sketched out. Do you carry a weapon in the van? No, not at all. I had my dog. Your 28-pound Frenchie? Yeah, he's actually 40. Oh, Jesus, he's a big boy. He's a big Frenchie. You know, but I really enjoyed just even sleeping on the side of the road. I don't know. Every day it was different. Like sometimes for sure, if I would hear like 
someone walking by and I could create in my head like, oh, there you go. I'm in a horror story. But if anything, I jump in the front seat and I go. I'm sure your parents and your brother probably do worry when they think about you pulling over to the side of the road and sleeping in your van. But whatever. You've probably (laughs) experienced bad stuff because you grew up in the big city. I think you were from Montreal growing up and Frank Raymond as your older brother. Frank eventually is going to be a pro skier. He's three years older than you, and while I hear you two may be butting heads now, did you always look up to Frank and his friends when you were growing up? Yeah, I was kind of looking up to my brother, for sure. Just the sports he was doing and all that stuff. You know, as a family, we kind of all do it together, so I did learn so many sports. Well, you guys were expected to be skiers, right? Like, you have a cousin or an uncle who was on the Canadian team, and then your dad was like a motocross guy, and both sides of the family ski for generations. Like, you guys were born, and they knew you were going to be skiers, and then it was up to you to find your other sports that you were going to be into? Yeah, I started skiing. I was one years old, like, straight up. And I started ski racing. I was five, because, yes, I wanted to do it right away, and my brother was doing already his races and I was like I want to do that now so I started super early but also like my brother and I grew up super well balanced kind of we did a lot of music a lot of arts and we did a lot of other sports so in Montreal we had our sports during the week and then the weekend we'd go ski racing so at some point I had to make a choice between ski racing or I was a world competitive diver so at some point I stopped racing and I was fully immersed into diving you know like uh, training 40 something hours uh, a week and traveling only for that and really buy the book and then it's when my brother actually moved to Whistler and I went and visit him I was like wait a second you know I've always been that black sheep within the diving crew like I get along with everyone I love it Uh, But like the creative side was always calling me, you know, I always had different friends doing different stuff, loving to do other sports as well. I was a really good diver, a really good ski racer. We are talented in anything we do, not to be cocky or anything, but we really are like it's super natural. But when he did move to Whistler, I was just like, wow, I didn't understand how there was like so many creative people and passionate people in one town. And living the most beautiful lifestyle. And that's what I wanted ASAP. So my brother definitely brought that to me. Well, you had to see your brother go from being a hockey player and a ski racer to picking skiing. And then he moves forward with skiing. Your parents see him have a future in skiing in their eyes. And then he sees the whole twin tip revolution come around. And he's like, hey, I'm done with all the skiing that I used to do. And they were like, we've invested so much time and you've gotten so far. And you're going to throw this all away to ski backwards in the park and there's no future. So you're at home and you get to see your brother go through all that with your parents. And he kind of breaks them in. And then at the same time, you have to pick something like you start with gymnastics and skiing. And then it becomes diving and skiing. And eventually you have to put skiing in the backseat because diving so serious. Does it like take over everything in your world? Like school almost becomes backseat? Well, kind of like I had a choice either doing World Cup ski racing or I had to go to Germany to do a world in diving. And like, to be honest, at that time, I was like, I kind of want to just dive. And I would think it's super exciting when you're 12 years old and going to Germany and stuff like that. There's the excitement of the travel. But is it also weird where, like, I'm guessing that you're kind of in a bubble by yourself traveling, no family or anyone around. Is that tough as, like, a young kid? No, that's actually pretty rad. You're left by yourself and you have all your friends. You travel with your friends. That was pretty cool. No, it wasn't scary at all traveling by myself when I was super young. It was actually a thrill. I loved it. I'm like, bring it on. That's what I loved the most. But then at some point, I'm like, okay, I can do that by myself. You know, like, there's a lot of other things I want to do. And Diving can get monotonous, I would think, because you're going to the same place all the time. It doesn't matter what country you're in. A pool is a pool, pretty much. The vending machines probably change when you go there. But the big difference between skiing and water is the way that you impact. And while skiing, there's a lot of breaks, a lot of tears. I would think a lot of hard slams in the water can be pretty brutal as well. I don't know if you break bones or ligaments, but I would think eardrums go. What do you see in the pool when someone has a mess up? You can mess up your back, but it's never really intense. Or you can hit your head on the board, right? But like, what's cool? I know it's not really the question, but what's cool about diving and what taught me, I think, and it's important to say, it's like 
it's really self-control, body control, fear control, how to focus right, especially the place where I train and the coaches there, they have such an amazing way to bring you up that all that I've learned, I could also bring it in life, like uh, day to day. So it's not just all air awareness. It's like a whole lot more than that. Yeah, for sure. And what was like turning me off is because like there was no style. I, I couldn't be like completely me. We had to do exactly what we needed to compete. Right. And it takes so long to get there too, which You know, when you're on your tippy toe on the 10 meter and you have one chance to do one dive and everybody's looking at you and holding their breath. It's very interesting to learn how to master that, if that makes sense. It does. And so the goal in both skiing at one point, I would think, and with diving is to make the Olympics. And I don't know if it is as much in skiing, but that is potentially something that you could do. And I think you work with the Canadian team on both the dive side and maybe the ski side. Do they treat yeah. skiers or divers better? Uh, I don't know, but you know, it's so weird because like I started skiing, obviously, when I came into Whistler and I was just like, wow, I just want to film. Like, I feel like I have that creative touch that I can create something pretty rad here and I want to be part of a movie. But like, also, I'm a girl and like I'm jumping off topic for a sec, but like, yeah, when you see guys in skiing back in the days. They always had a crew. There's always one of the boys that's like, I'm going to film. And then the other boy is like, okay, so I can organize something for us. And then there's the other guys that are like, okay, all I got to do is ski, right? Yep. And then that's pretty rad. But then I was just like finding myself, wow, it's either I compete in skiing and freestyle skiing, or how do I create this for myself? And like in the eyes of like film producers back then, it's like, oh, well, Girls are not that important, you know? We just don't see it. That was rough, but that's all I wanted. I didn't want to compete in skiing. I didn't care. I got out of this world because I wanted to be completely me and I had nothing to do with compete. I hate competing. I compete with myself enough, like that's for sure. And to be totally honest, when I was looking for results in competitions in diving and in skiing, there aren't many results for you. I think in skiing, you got a ninth at X Games once. And there's. And by the way, that X Game ninth, I had a blown knee and I had a damaged cartilage that was like a rock and that literally grinded all of my meniscus. So I didn't ski a month prior to X Games and I didn't ski for months after the X Games. I was just such a mess. But contest, and I look at your brother too. You guys both maybe have an emotional side to you where everything is all about style, but I feel like when they would be like three, two, one, time for Mode Raymond to drop in, that's where shit hits the fan. And then you come off a rail early and your run's ruined, and then you can just show all your style and everybody's like talking about your run after the event, but you never had good finishes. And when the pressure's on, was that a problem? No, that's actually the thing. When the pressure's on, like I just said, with diving, the pressure's on for real. And I never had a problem with that. I can focus, tune in and go. I think the problem with me with like competing is that one, it's not what I wanted to do. I just yep. thought I needed to get a result in order to like finally film. And it wasn't the pressure on. I was just always fucking injured. And I'm going to say fucking because what the fuck? Oh, we're going to talk about your injuries. My first contest that I did was U.S. Open, and I had two blown knees at the same time. I just blew my knees, I think, two weeks before the U.S. Open. There's not one time in skiing in my contest that I was healthy. So, like, as much as I wanted to, I didn't. And, by the way, for, like, competition result in diving... I did have a lot of really good results. Same thing with ski racing, but I think it's been so old school that it's just not on the them. internet. Yeah. So we'll catch everybody up to where you are. So your mom and you go and visit Frank and Whistler and you kind of see Frank's mm. lifestyle, but you're still a diver at that point. You've just finished high school. Yeah. You go back home after a week and in your mind, you've already made it up. Like, I'm going to move to Whistler. And when you have to break that to the coaches and people like that on the dive side, are they like totally bummed? Were they like, you're throwing your whole life away? They're so bummed. My mom didn't really know about it. My dad was just like, do what you want. And I'm like, 
are you still gonna love me if I'm not a diver? And he's like, dude, really? Like, come on, do whatever you want. So I did finish high school. I was still a diver, but all I wanted was to be outside of it. And I'm like, maybe I don't love it anymore, you know? And then finally, I did quit. And obviously, going to Whistler and feeling so happy and free. You know, like when you said we are all about style, yes. it, it's not really true to me, meaning like it's not really style. It's like more how you feel. I don't care how it looks. If it feels good, it just feels good. And like, I guess that I had like the good body coordination or whatnot that it make it look stylish. I never looked at myself in a video and like, oh, I should make this look more stylish. Well, you were doing tricks back then that other girls weren't doing and you were doing them right no. away. Like you get to Whistler and you're spinning 1080s and I Rex know. Thomas sees you in the park spinning a 1080 and he's like, that girl is going to be on the triplets. And that was weird in itself, the whole advertising campaign behind those skis. But your whole career is like a lot of good with a lot of bad. Like you get sponsored so quick by Atomic and then within months is when you blow the first knee. I think you're in the park with Frank. And then what do you do the next knee a couple months later? No, better than that. So I go shred and like, I remember it was the cutest thing ever. Sarah Bird came up with me in the chair and she's like, hey, Mo, like, you know, I did my first cork 900 because of you. I was just like, who's that girl in the black park just doing that? I need to step up. And she did tell me this. And I was just like, no way, like huh. sick. So, yes, I had no fear from diving and from my background in ski racing. It's like, oh, why? like the bigger, the better. And that was super good. And when Rex Thomas saw me, he's like, dude, I need you to come to Orash Masters. Remember that contest? And I went with Charlie Yeager and Sherpa and Josh Stack. And that's where I met those guys. And it was the best. But you know what? A week before I left for California, I fractured both my heels at the same time, like fully fractured. Oh. Because I overshot the last jump in, in Black Park. Like straight up, I landed. And I didn't even move. I just slid to the chairlift. And on my way up, it was hurting so much. I was ready to jump off. And then I got up. They drugged me and they brought me down. And then I had to go to Orange Masters. See, that was my first contest. Already coming in injured. What am I doing? And then came back. But yeah, I think like my legs weren't made for it because of all the training for diving. And I blew both my knees. Wait, you're right. I blew one of my knees, which I didn't know. The physio told me it was just stretch. So I waited two months and then I went to US Open or something like that. And then came back. I wanted to impress Jeff Thomas because I wanted to film with him. So I did a rail jam and I landed back seat, didn't want to fall. And like since I compensated so much, I blew my other knee. So I realized that I blew both my ACL first year. Yeah, nailed it. And you got lucky that you were able to talk the doctors into doing both at the same time, because if you couldn't talk them into doing it, that would have taken like two and a half years off of your skiing. So hear this, though. Chris Turpin, I was living with him at the time. He's like, Mo, I did a few of them. It's going to be OK, blah, blah. I'm like, you did a few of them? No. And then I did go back home. I meet the surgeon. He was very rude, you know, most really high end surgeon are rude. And at first he was so rude with me. He's like, we can do one in six months and the other one six months later. I'm like, no, I want both at the same time. Like I quit diving, moved to the place I loved the most, made amazing friends. I feel so creative. I feel like in the right path, I'm doing the right thing. I just feel so aligned. And all of a sudden, what? I need to go back home and do this for so long. I'm like, oh my God, this is terrible. So I sit in front of the surgeon. The surgeon looks at me. And I was like, I want to do both at the same time. He says, no, no, no. And then finally, he's like, you know what, princess? And he called me princess. <laughs> you know what? You're such a princess. And like very rude to me. I'm like, I'm a princess because I want to suffer double, you know? I'm like, no, no, no. And he's like, okay, the best I can do, I can do one ACL. And then in two months, you can do the other one if you can take it. He said it like that. So I did one ACL. A week and a half later, I did the second one. Now it's time for a sponsor break, and my first sponsor is the Ten Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. 
They have been brewing the best beer in the Northwest since 2006, and they started as a bunch of friends who live beer, brewing, and drinking it outside. Over the years, they have grown, but they have never forgotten their roots in skiing, snowboarding, and biking. I could list the countless things they have done for the sports and athletes, or even better, list the things they've done for the causes like the Surf Rider Foundation and Protect Our Winners, but I don't have enough time. What I do have time to do is ask you to pick up a six-pack of 10-barrel next time you're at the store. And if you are more of a booze person, 10-barrel mixed drinks pack a punch. To find out more about all things 10-barrel, head on over to 10barrel.com. My final sponsor this round is one of my favorites, Stanley. And we may as well start their ad with the most important part. I'm going to save you 30% on all Stanley products. This is an amazing deal that can be unlocked with the code DRINKFAST. That's all one word and lowercase. And you use it when you check out at Stanley1913.com. And if you spend over $200 with that code DRINKFAST, Stanley will also ship you a Powell Movement beanie with your order. It's a limited edition beanie, and Stanley's an amazing brand that I hope you know about. They're the ones that invented the category of keeping things hot and cold back in 1913. Think about that green bottle that used to keep your grandpa's coffee hot. That's the Stanley I'm talking about. They make all the things that you're going to need for your parking lot lunch sessions at the ski hill and your summer camping and RVing adventures. So head on over to Stanley1913.com for that deal. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. The reality that you learn next in the ski business is when new team managers get hired by companies, it can screw up a whole team and a lot of people's lives. I think Charlie Ager found out the hard way that Atomic had a new team manager and you did as well. You're like 20 years old. Everything's going right in your life other than injuries, but you're able to quit diving and get sponsored and skiing right away. Then your big sponsor drops you. Is that just like the first big punch to your stomach? other than injury in your career where you're like, what the fuck? Well, you know, I think it's also important to say that like big sponsors back then, it was almost no money. So it's like, okay, maybe I'm losing a thousand dollars. That was straight up that. But the hardest part was, yeah, being dropped because, oh, she's not going to make it. She, she did two ACLs. Who does that and comes back, right? First off. And then second, it's such a men's world. And I only realize it now we'll talk about it later maybe but like i only realize it now looking back i'm like holy shit how did i just not figure this out but yeah it's super hard it's like you lose everything you gotta rebuild and retrust retrust on yourself retrust your legs try to reach out try to market your way and make them understand that it's not about skew results or crazy tricks it's about how we do it and how i can sell also i understood that business already Well, there was definitely a buzz around your name at that point because you get healthy, you lose Atomic as a sponsor. And this is right around the time that I meet you and you're figuring out who you're going to ski for next. We're at the Raj Masters. Michelle Parker was hurt. Anna Siegel was hurt. And it was like, we don't have anybody to represent our team for the Masters. And your brother is on the team. And it's one of those things where the team manager wins prizes too. And it was like, we are going to win this contest. And We were coming off a Camp K2 week where it was like an all-time high and it was like, shit, we need somebody. And Frank was like, my sister, but you know, she's talking to Armada. You'd have to like really sponsor her. And I was like, fuck it, man. She's your sister. I know how you ski. That's enough for me. And I offered, I think, a spot to be on the K2 (laughs) team. It wasn't Aura's Masters because, you know, that was bad. That's when I got on Atomic. It was a contest in Utah in Park City that I won because I did like a Bio 10 at the end too. Uh, it was Virginie Favre that was hosting it. I'm talking about a Raj Masters in Whistler, not in California. Mm, I never did it. No, no, you didn't did do I it. Did do that? No, oh, I, yeah. but I offered it to you because Anna wasn't going to ski. You declined. You turned me down, which was kind of good for both of us because Anna did end up skiing. And she was kind of a little hurt, but your brother did like a 720 screaming semen and that ended up okay, winning it for us. And you were there, but you didn't ski for us. But we did offer you a slot on the team. It was like, fuck it. She's Frank Raymond's sister. I know how Frank skis. <laughs> we needed a woman. And we were one of those people that didn't just have token women. We had like five girls on the team, which was crazy for anybody at that point. But we won the Masters without you. And Anna was able <laughs> to get healthy. And you went on to start your career with Armada from there. Yeah, I think it's because I already signed with Armada before. Yeah, how did that happen? The way they brought me, it's actually Chris O'Connell. He called me. He's like, you just won this contest. And that's also when I was talking to you. 
And the reason why I went with Armada is because they're like, we're starting a woman's clothing line. And obviously this rings a bell. And he's like, we want to have your input. Like you can be the first girl there and help us build that. And obviously in my head, it's like, Phew, this is exactly what I want. And to be honest, back then I'm like, oh, they are based out of California. This is even better. It all worked itself in my head. I'm like, you know what? I kind of want to be part of this for sure. All I know, I knew, was I just love skiing and I want to do as much as I can. And I love fashion and I love the ski stuff and I could never find what I wanted. And that was annoying to me. So I decided to go with Armada. So the whole like mad mode thing, that's nothing calculated at all. You've been like that since you were like a kid. You've always had your own style. You've always wanted to incorporate what you want into your clothes. And it doesn't really matter the brand or anything. It's more about the product that they're putting out. And that's always been that way for you. Well, yeah, like even as a diver or as like a ski racer, I was always bringing clothes that are outside of what people were wearing and other brands. And even at diving too, I had different bathing suits or I would go create mine and people would follow the lead. And I just did it for myself, to be honest. I was just like, I just, I just want to mix two things together. And I just love doing that. That's what's fun about it all. And it motivated me to do better. I don't even know why. It just, I love it. It's empowering. So you have your own style and you pay attention to the details. And for drama's sake, I'm going to bring up an interview that I found on the internet where Uh Jen Hudek was asked about the fact that there's no lack of talent for female skiers. And the interview goes on to say, for example, I think Maude Raymond is one of the most talented skiers in the sport. And Jen comes back and says, Maude is a tough one for me because she uses her looks to get more attention. And there was more to the answer, but none of which really pertained to you there. Did you ever no, hear about I that back in the day? No, I never heard that. I never heard that. And better than that, I never read any interviews of me, never article in magazines, even when I spoke or anything. I always stayed clear of it. I had no clue. Even if I would put an edit, I would never check the comment. I couldn't care less. I don't know why. So, no, I never heard this. And it's kind of funny that she says that I'm using my looks. That's so funny. Well, I mean, I'm the believer of you should use whatever that you can to get attention in the right way when you're starting a brand for yourself. And if it's your personal style or your looks or whatever, if it's just you being yourself. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. But I was doing it for myself, though. But I was and I am very aware. Like, I don't really party. I won't be the girl that's going to be dancing on a table like I clearly took care of my image but also just by being myself right so like if I was wearing something it's not to appeal a certain style or do this or do that you know I never had my boobs out or my g-string out you know what I mean I mean I just found it on the internet (laughs) and I realized that it would probably get a rise out of you so I brought it up probably the wrong thing for me to do but hey it's a podcast and we want to make things interesting Go for and it. And with all the things that you've done in your career, it all comes in spurts. I know what you're going to bring up. Oh, no. I'm not, I mean, oh. like everything comes in spurts. Like you bang out a lot of mad yeah. mode content and then you blow out your knee and then you get yourself better in like 2013. Then you bang out some more content and then you hurt your shoulder. And I broke my back. I did all for all. I did four ACL surgery. I broke my shoulder. I broke L2, L3, L4 in my back. I had a million other surgeries for touch-ups in my knees. And like, the thing is that I couldn't tell anyone. I had to hide that. So like, for sure, I decided to quit competing because I'm like, look, competing is not for me. I don't even know why I'm putting myself into that. And it's actually Iberg that's like, actually, just put an edit. He's like, mode just film something it doesn't need to be perfect it doesn't need to be quality just go out and do something this is what we love and this is what i want to see iberg was saying that and this is what you should be doing and i'm like really so i did and it was solo i think you could see from just the way that your brother's career was i mean he was doing that as well he was more part of cruise like you said earlier he was part of a bigger group of people doing it mm-hmm. But you're kind of like a one woman marketing machine out there, helping brands create product, creating your own content. Not that you're doing it all by yourself. Yeah, pretty much. You bring up Iberg and that brings me to an interesting part of my podcast that goes perfectly with Iberg. It's called the Weed Maps question of the podcast. And with you, you've had so many injuries. You've probably spent countless years of your life hurt. But wait, I, I need to stop you here. And I need to say 
that because of all my injuries, I probably skied half of my career. It was the craziest ups and downs, but all to say that this is where I mastered marketing. This is where I'm like, okay, how can I make it look so I don't lose all my sponsors all over again? What can I do to add? So I started girl ski camps and this and that, you know, like I tried so hard. It's like, okay, I'm injured, but I can film a little bit. I'm not going to be on top of it, but I can work my creativity. So I can still do something interesting. And I know that those things can sell clothes. So if I can do all of this together, I think this is the key of like, even though I'm injured through all of this, I can still produce something that a company can be appealed with. And that took a while to understand. Now everybody understands. Yeah, you can eliminate a few different calls from team managers when you're getting cleaned up on knees because you have content and stuff that you can put out that's going to keep your name out there because you've always been relevant even when you've been hurt and it's been going on for you know more than a decade. And no one knows. They know after the fact, way after, like, holy shit, she's gone through so much and she still skis so well. I think now I'm sort of like, hey, wait a second, you kids that are talking to me and stuff, like, there is so much that I went through. You have no clue. That wasn't fun. That wasn't easy. Like, it didn't show. It all seems awesome. But this is why I also didn't progress the craziest way possible. I had to manage all of that all the time. Anyway, sorry, go on. No, it's okay. So the weed maps question of the podcast yeah. is managing pain. And I know oh. you can't just take pills all the time. I'm sure there's a lot of surgeries no. where you have to, but I'm sure that gets old. Were you able to use weed or CBD or anything to no. help mitigate the pain or is it just too much to handle? No, I'm not a weed person. I don't smoke weed, even though I hung out with Tannerol and all those guys. I'm not like a drinker. I'm not a weed smoker. I also come from that background of diving. So I just figured out that I'm like, okay, if I want to continue skiing, if I want to take care of it, I just need to hustle. And I don't know how I manage pain. I have a very high tolerance, but I think my mind can tune out of this. Pain kind of disappear, but obviously I went through the craziest pain stuff, but I never was like a painkiller person. I never was a weed smoker or CBD person. And no, I never went there. And now we've got a few words from Weed Maps. Weed Maps is exactly what it sounds like. It's simply the place to go online when it comes to finding what you need so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. The cannabis market can be a bit of a treasure hunt, but Weed Maps will get you straight to the source with no worries. Whether you're seeking out the best locations, deals, doctors, or strains, we offer online ordering and delivery where legal. No need to waste your precious time searching elsewhere. Go to WeedMaps.com or download the free app today. It's your ultimate guide to cannabis. Weed Maps. You get through the knee, you get through the shoulder, and I think things are lining up where the Olympics are going to be in 2014. And while talking to you, it doesn't sound like that's probably a goal of yours to really want to go to the Olympics. But no, it sounds like it's an option on the table of like, if you try, yeah. you might be able to make the Olympic team. And at this point, you're healthy. For most of 2013, you're healthier than you normally are. And then you go to Hood and you knuckle a jump at the end of 2013 in that season. Is that what ruins your chances at the Olympics or were the Olympics a consideration? Or? No. So the Olympics was still a consideration. I was looking at that and like I was in hood. I was filming and that was the kind of life I wanted to do. I was like, wow, I feel good. You know, it's always like that. Before you get hurt, you kind of like, oh, you always feel on top of the world. And then I did that, went back home. I wasn't sure. I remember being with Jess Tidswell, who is also Tanner All's PT for the longest time. and. We were talking a lot and she supported me so much emotionally through my fourth ACL. That was really hard, especially coming back from a broken back. And I was like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? So I went into rehab, but then I realized I'm like, you know what? Why not give it a shot? Why not? So I did my ACL and I mixed my new ACL with a fake ACL. And by now, my surgeon who thought it was in princess, he respects me so much. We're friends, you know? Right. He actually braided with a fake one. It took me five months of like insane rehab, dedication. And I was like, okay, I'm doing this. And by talking to the Dutor people, I got a spot for Dutor. And I was like, okay, my tricks are there. I'm so solid. I'm so consistent. I finally understood it all. And then I drove from Montreal to Colorado, final spot there. I'm like, okay, okay, 
that was an intense five months, but I feel just stronger and healthier than ever and so balanced in so many ways. And I'm like, I'm going to try and go for this and film it. My goal was to film through it all. So this is like kind of not of a cool story, but I'm still going to tell you quick. Okay. So I go to Colorado and then I'm in the gym and then due to is very soon. I have my tricks all locked down. And then I see JF Kisson and the other guy from Team Canada, which I love them both. Anyway, so I see them. I'm in the gym. They're like, whoa, you're looking good. I see you out there. You're looking so strong. You already have a spot for the first qualification. Like, And that was JF Kisson. My advice to you would be don't do do tour and focus on the other contest in like three weeks and give it all the first qualification. I'm like, really? And then I thought of it and the more I would go and I'm like, yeah, you're right. Do tour, you know, the weather is always bad. And I text him again. Are you sure? Yes, Mo, this is what I think is the best thing for you. I'm like, okay. And I text the other coach. Are you guys sure? Like, yes, I think it's a good thing. Like, we want you to succeed, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Like, I came this far. This is probably the best way to go. Like, I can listen to a coach. Okay, I'll listen to them. Let's go. So I remember going to the course the day before and just seeing the girls and saying, hey, how are you? And Dania looks at me and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? I just came and, and saw you guys. I'm just going to focus on the next contest with this qualification. She's like, didn't you get the email yesterday? You need to do do tour in order to get that spot. Oh. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? The coach just told me no. And it was already like the last day of training. And since I didn't do training, I couldn't do it. Or I thought it was like the day of the contest I went there. I'm like, are you serious? And I kind of freaked out, called GF Cusson. GF Cusson felt so bad, didn't answer. And then I emailed like the team Canada and all that stuff. And then, yeah, they sent an email to my old email. And it was like a last minute change of rules. And they sent that like, I think a day before the contest, which is not fair and I was like are you serious I did all that for that and I remember staying in my room for two weeks crying because I worked so hard and then I was like really like are you serious I worked so damn hard for this and it's like the one time you're healthy so healthy bulletproof healthy you know what I mean and like that really totally crushed me I guess the moral of the story is never take a contest off I don't know if you're healthy enough to do it and you were planning on doing it and I get that JF Cusson told you not to do it, but at the end of and the day, Sutherland. what's his name? Sutherland. Yeah. If you would have done it, that would have opened up your potential to have made the team. So if you're healthy yeah. enough to compete, you should never take anything off. But and it's so hard because when I email like hire people at Team Canada, they're like, well, if the coach told you so, it's maybe because you weren't ready. I'm like, no, 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 that wasn't it. That was far from it. Come on. You can't say it. Anyways, it doesn't matter. And you've known that guy since you were like five years old. Forever. And we're talking about the head coaches. Both of the coaches came and advised me to do so. So I really thought it was the best thing. I'm like, well, why not really wait for that contest that I actually need? Actually be smart and not just do it to do it. Actually be smart and do the one that counts. Anyways, that was completely off but then you know what this is where i'm like fuck all that i never wanted to do that like the contest i just want to film and like obviously there to another struggle is that getting budget i'm skiing for armada they don't really have girls on the team <sighs> but obviously like i don't want to throw them on the bus here but i feel like i always had to prove myself to try and get budget in order to film and do something. And then I proved them by doing all of this. And then I realized like I wasn't going forward enough. And I was just like, okay. And I went for O'Neill for a bit. How many women are on the Armada program? Well, last year I did sign a few girls. I kind of created the program last year. So are you on Armada now? Yeah, I'm on Armada clothing and skis. And they didn't have any girls. And obviously like I'm so pro woman at the moment. And for the last few years, I was like, let's go, guys. Like, we need more girls on the team. We need to create things. But obviously, their priority wasn't that. It's a small company. They have a lot of things to do. 
Now it's time for my final sponsor break, and Peter Glenn Ski and Sports is your one-stop shop for all things ski, snowboard, skate, run, water. Peter Glenn has had it all and has had it all for over 60 years. This week, Peter Glenn is doing an O'Brien Clutch 138 wakeboard and binding giveaway to celebrate spring. The clutch features a timeless shaped board that pro-level riders have fun shredding on, but is just as comfortable teaching new riders how to play on the water. To enter the contest, follow Peter Glenn Sports and O'Brien Water Sports on Instagram, like the giveaway post, and tag two friends you'd like to take out on the water. Winners are drawn on Friday, April 2nd, and it's one entry per person. To find out more about Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, head on over to peterglenn.com. My final sponsor is Elon Skis, and they have been building a cult following in the States for a few years now. Why? Because their skis are better than everyone else's. And believe me, I worked at a ski manufacturer for 16 years. I know what a quality product looks like when it comes out of the factory. And you aren't going to get any better quality than you're going to find with your Elan skis. And that's just the craftsmanship. They ski even better. They're rock solid underfoot at the highest of speeds, yet still lightweight. And there's no chatter at all. And in just a few months, I can feel my skiing getting better. And that's no joke. You will feel the same thing. To find out more about all things Elan, head on over to elanskis.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Your job is to be the squeaky wheel. I mean, you're not making enough money to not fight for women. You know, it's not like they're paying you shut up money. Yeah. And then so last year I came up to Hans and Hans was like, okay, yeah, you pushed enough. Let's do this. Obviously, we need to do this. Let's do this. Like, let's just do this together. So that was pretty cool. I had like a pretty cool like campaign idea. And then we finally signed Britta for real. Like I went and did like, okay, Britta, you need to be signed. This is it. Britta Sigourney? Yeah. And then so I kind of created the structure with Hans. It's all I wanted to do. And they have amazing products. And this is what I was lacking of my entire career, like opportunities. I had to work so hard to get just one video out. But let's be honest, you've worked so hard for next to nothing, if you think about it. Like, how much (laughs) is the most you made in your career in one year? And we'll talk in Canadian, so it sounds higher. But have you made more than 80 grand Canadian from skiing alone in a year? No. Even close to that? No. Now, if you were a man at your level and the type of skier that you are with not doing contests and being known for just oozing style, if you're a man, you're going to be making some of that money between the five sponsors that you have. Never did that because they didn't understand. And then it was just so hard. And it still is, to be honest, like to make more money. I was doing camps, but also I was genuine about it. I wanted to give back to women. Women work together. This is what you, we want to do. Don't separate ski and snowboarding. This is so old school. Come on, guys. You know, like work together. I'll help you. And my mentality to help and doing camps, it's like, girls, I'm going to teach you a way of living. And I was doing the same thing with clothing. I was trying to make a little bit of money. Like, okay, by doing that, the camps, and by doing videos, I can probably sell products so I can survive a bit more. This is where I was going to companies. And obviously at that time, my, like you said, I didn't win X games. I'm not this chick. You know what I mean? So I'm like, no, like, look, I have a sense of style. I can create something. This is missing. We can do this. We can tweak that. We can recreate this thing and then we can sell. And then that was the way I can make a little bit more money. But I feel like I was not at the right time at the right moment. You look at your brother. I mean, your brother was not the A team of K2 had like two tiers the Seth Pettits, and then the next tier was your brother and a lot of other people who were all pretty badass skiers, whatever. But you are on at least your brother's level, and I know from just a ski sponsor, he's making like 10 grand a year, and then he's got a goggle sponsor. He was probably putting together 50, 60 grand Canadian at one year, maybe once. And they had someone already to film and to do this and do that. Oh, for sure. To do is go there and party. You know what I mean? I was trying to get a filmer that can film me for close to nothing. But it's been so fun at the same time. Like when I look back at also all my injuries and what it gave me back, I'm like, why the fuck did I go through this? But you know what? The love of this sport, the love of the feeling it gets me, the love of maybe the struggle even, even like just to 
let's go mode. Like, I don't know why I didn't, I didn't want to prove anything to anyone. It was just, I loved it so much. And this lifestyle is mine. And I was like, I need this. I don't know why it's always brought me back. It's weird. I think about the lifestyle and it's like, you couldn't do this being an American, like from the 18 to 20 knee surgeries that you've had, your broken back, your (laughs) shoulder, all that stuff. You pay for that surgery by surgery here in the U.S. and you would be broke. You would eventually have to just call it, be like, hey, I'm not going to be able to afford this sport anymore because it's just so expensive. I mean, you have more. You put like a ski went through your eye at one point. What happened on that one? Oh, my God. Oh, my God, Mike. This is what I was scared to talk about, but I will. I will. I'm there. I'll do it. You put a ski through your eye. Did you just pull a truck driver and just pull the the tip through your face? (laughs) You're so funny, truck driver. That's so rad. No, better than that. So I need to rewind a little bit before that event. So that year was the most fucked up year in my entire life. And it actually made me realize after that year that I'm like, whoa, for all of a sudden, I looked to my career and I was like, did I go through all that? How did I do that? Because something would happen, brush it off. aim. I don't know how I did all that. I swear to God, now I look back and it took me a while to figure it out. So that year, everything was against me. It started that I had chronic pain for two years. So this is when I stopped doing edits. People were like, why aren't you doing edits and stuff? Okay, wait. I was filming with Greta. We wanted to create something together. I was in Utah and I'm like, I'm not feeling good. Call my surgeon, not feeling good. Come in, go on the table try to take off one of the screw in my tibia, you know, like for ACL, you have two screws. Yep. He takes it out and he's like, that will probably ease the pain. It never did. So I was skiing with so much pain, Mike, and it's like chronic pain. So it's like skiing with a toothache 24 seven, but it never leaves you. There's not one injection, one pill, literally nothing would help it. And Within those two years, I was trying to make edits, but I just didn't even have it in me. Like even walking wasn't working out. And the fact that I couldn't work out made me very scared to ski because if I don't have the balance in my legs, I don't have the balance in my knees. But I was still trying to do things and figure it out again, not to lose my sponsors. Not to lose the 400 bucks a month that you have coming in. Yeah, fuck me. But then uh, there's other things that are pretty cool. So I started school there too. I didn't need to do it. I just did it. So I don't know why. I had something to do. But while I was going through that, I was still trying to ski. And then I gathered as much information from a bunch of surgeons that I went to see. Even my, the surgeon that thought I was a princess, like my buddy, was just like, Mode, maybe it's in your head. I'm like, I'm sorry. You can see how fucked up it looks. It's clearly not in my head. So I went and did a bunch of tests and went to see a bunch of surgeons. And I was just like, okay, I need to do surgery. This is what I think is what's going on. The whole of that screw I took out is not healing and it's not working. So he's like, okay, I'm going to help you. And then he finally went in there. Okay. A few months before I get that surgery, I go to Mexico. No, sorry. This is pretty fucked up. Okay. So I need to tell you. That it sounds so surreal, but it's so true. I'm just waiting for a ski to go through your eye, but I'm going to sit back and listen, and I'm sure it's going to happen at some point. The ski that goes through my eye is like the grand finale. Okay, so let's hear what happens in Mexico. A bit before Mexico. So I have to go to Whistler for like a Fido thing, you know, trying to get paid and do stuff. And going out there, I swear, before I take the flight, I'm crying because I'm like hurting so much. I can't sleep because of that chronic pain. I can't work out. I can't even go for a walk. I can't live. And I'm like, I got to go ski, but I have to force myself. And when I would go ski for a full day, I almost had to go to sleep for two days. I actually took very strong sleeping pills for a good year and a half because of that. It sounds like terrible decisions all around, but whatever, you live your life. Yeah, but I was trying to figure out what was going on. And I cannot just sit and see my projects just go to waste and my sponsors all over again. So I was putting a lot more on my plate. Clearly, wrong decision for sure. So my grandfather is on his deathbed. I'm in Montreal. I'm going to see him. And then finally, there's like a crazy snowstorm. There's so much traffic. And I'm like, what's going on? I turn around. I'm like, okay, 
abortion. I got to go turn around. I have to go home. I'm never going to make it. Did you say you had an abortion? No, not abortion. Like, abort. Can I say that? Yeah, you, you can say that. I just wanted to clarify that you did not have an abortion. You just turned around and went home. I never had an abortion. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It just sounded like you said that. I know. I turned around and I got stuck on the highway for 13 hours. It's a long abortion. <laughs> it was so freaking cold. Peed in bottles. Didn't eat. Didn't know what to do. I'm just stuck there. I'm like, oh, okay. That was the first bad luck of those six months. And then... I end up a few days later going to Whistler. My grandfather passed away. Sorry. And then I fly to Whistler. I go ski Whistler. I'm in pain all the time. And then since I'm doing a bunch of new work for branding and whatnot and strategy and all that stuff, all marketing, I have a lot of content on my computer. I go to Whistler. I go to an art show. Uh, I come back at like 11 to my car that was parked in the parking lot. And then I realized there's some guys that stole a bunch of my stuff in my car because I had a rental car. And then they grabbed my computer. And I was just like, no. Long story short, I figured out who it was. And then we found him. And when I found him that same night, he freaked out. He pushed me and punched me. And he lost my computer, but we found him. However, I lost everything I created. Doesn't matter. Figured it out. Recreated it. And that was that. Right after that, I go back home. I have three days shoot for a high-end jacket company that I created and organized. So I'm hustling through that, take a flight, go to Mexico. I'm like, wow, that's the end of my season and tried my best. This is it. I go to Mexico. I'm with my ex-boyfriend, my boyfriend at the time. We passed through the borders. And then the girl was such a bitch. I'm so sorry, but she was such a bitch. She looked at me and she's like, your passport is damaged. I'm like, no, it's not damaged. I've been traveling with it for the last two years. There's like a little corner of like the plastic that came up. You can still scan it. Everything's okay. And she's like, no, nope, not passing. So no Mexico for you. They grab me and they bring me down in like a really crazy little room in the sketchiest place. It's like 430 in the morning. And there's no window. And like, as my eye adapts, I realize there's a toilet in the middle of the room. And there's like seven girls sleeping on the floor around. No way. I'm like, no way. Please, no. You're in a Mexican federal jail? And it's in the airport. Federales. They took my laces and all my jewelry. I can't even communicate with my boyfriend up there. I don't know what's going on. And the guards are so mean and just laughing at me. And so this trip starts with an, an aborted trip, then it gets yeah, it robbery, bad. and then you're in a Mexican jail with the federales, and then what happens? And then I stay in there 13 hours, and the girl that was like literally grabbing into my arm, she's like, I ain't getting deported, trust me. My uncle is like, very important in Mexico, I'll get you out of there, and I'm like, yeah, right. And then she's like, give me your number. So one girl that takes a pen out of her sock, give me a pen, give me your Facebook name. And I'm like, holy fuck, I'm never getting out of here, you know? And she's like, when I'm going to fly back to Colombia, I'll text this other girl. And you know what? It worked. It fucking worked. That girl was waiting for me at the exit after 13 hours. She left maybe four hours before me and her uncle helped me. And then my boyfriend ended up 12 hours later calling the embassy, and then all of this together got me out of there. I do one week there, legs still so in pain, but as soon as I touch ground, I'm going to get surgery right away. And then I go to get surgery, surgeons dealing with my surgery. I get out of there. He's like, okay, so I shaved down your bone. I went in and cleaned out that hole in your leg, and then I took out a bunch of your scar that was like super weird, and then it turned black. And then I got gangrene. So it's called necrosis. That's when you had necrophilia. I don't know what's necrophilia. Yeah, I'm sure it's the same thing. Don't worry about it. Necrosis. It kind of just turned black. And then I went to see another surgeon back in Montreal. He had to take out all the black spots. He's like, Modi, you can't have infection there. You can lose your leg. You're happy this is not spreading. We got to take care of it right now so it doesn't spread more. So I have a hole in my leg for a long time and I had to clean it and, and I had like a machine through it so it doesn't get infected because that's super scary, right? Yeah, yeah, you don't want to lose your leg. 
No, not at all. This is so fucked up. And then I have skin graft. I still have this kind of hole, but it's healing. And all of a sudden, I finally quit everything in my life. I'm like, I need a break from everything. I need to breathe. And then Armada called. He's like, hey, we just got bought by Ammer. We can do some things. And finally, it seems like they're like, yeah, we understand your value all of a sudden. So I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to start skiing in Gaspésie in Chicxa, which is like 10 hours driving from Quebec. I can go ski there and all that stuff. You're not living in pain right now. You're like, I'm testing this out again for the first time in a long time. Yeah, it actually worked. And then I go skiing. This feels good. And then the owner of this place, he's like, hey, I want to go do some helicopter. I'm like, really? And I'm a bit PTSD with everything that happened. But I'm like, yeah, okay. You're in Quebec, right? Yeah, it's like, come on. It's so small. Why would I need a helicopter? I can just skin up or cat up. But he was so happy and the owner has four kids. So I kind of trusted him. I'm like, you know what? You're right. Okay, I'm good doing it. You're so happy to offer this to me. Let's go. So we go and then I'm super nervous. I really don't feel good. I don't know why. But, you know, I'm trusting the whole thing. And then at some point we come down and I remember sitting in the back and it was a girl pilot and she seemed nervous. So she comes to land, white out, all the powder, you know, came up. She couldn't go back up. She completely got lost. She started going, shifted left, and the helicopter started hitting trees. I swear to God. I was sitting there, and I was like, okay, well, life got me. Yeah. I mean, you're chopping down lumber with the blade of the helicopter. I would think it's over. I was sure I was dying. And you know when everything all of a sudden becomes like so slow motion? I'm like focusing on one screw on the floor. And you know, helicopters, like they explode. They're like straight up in movie. They're made out of paper. They explode. Then I don't know how, but the pilot pulled it off. She kind of like did a move and dropped the helicopter. We weren't too high from the ground and she kind of dropped it. And then we got out. Uh, the heli is really not in good shape. And we realized we were one foot from dying because the blade almost touched the ground. And I remember coming back to my place not talking for three days and I'm like okay this is fucked up and now I have to go to Japan how's your body after this I mean your helicopter crash do you get hurt in that one no 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 everybody's healthy and sound okay and then I'm like okay I go back home and I'm like okay I organize a trip with Taylor Gobberg Callie Vanuler and I think the fourth day in I was having a good day everything was chill there was a tourist video. I didn't need to go nuts. I just wanted to show solid shredding. And I jump off a tree, but I had some kingpins. I remember the guy at Armada, he's like, hey, can you bring like touring stuff? We need touring stuff. And he's like, just buy kingpins. And there was a recall. I realized a couple of weeks later, there was a recall on those bindings. So they didn't release or they did. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, I land and the heel release, but not the front. So it's like, it's like, you know, when you cross country ski and your knee, you kind of slip, your knee goes forward yeah, and automatically you kind of go laying on your knee and the tip comes up, right? Do you know what I mean? Because yep. your heel's not attached. Yeah. You're like your telly. Yeah. And as soon as I landed, I didn't get anything. I thought I was hit by a train. Heel came out. The tip of my ski went whammed. Just pivoted into your face? Yeah, and I was pivoted towards the top of my ski too, right? Do you understand the concept? Yeah, yeah. And it went wha bam. And just by doing that, my goggles lift up and then it hit my eye. It was so fucked up. I didn't understand anything. Um, Taylor killed it for me. I can't even believe got me out of that backcountry. I thought I lost my eye. I thought I broke my face. It was so fucked up. We had to do like three hospitals. It was super complicated. And then I ended up having 12 stitches. But then, yeah, I went back home and figured that one out. And this is where I also realized before when I was younger and people were asking me like, so is there a difference between male and woman? And obviously, I didn't really get the pay stuff. I was ignoring it because I didn't want to create one. You know what I mean? Like there is a huge gap, guys, but I'm trying to just go and not see gender. 
I'm trying not to separate it even more and not really put too much attention to it. But looking at all that now, I'm like, it's such a male driven thing. Maybe better now, but anyway. It's not much better by any means, but I will say that I asked one question about a ski going through your eye and that was like 23 minutes ago. I'm so sorry. No, it's quite all right. But that's going to be the podcast. We talked about a lot of stuff. I think you piled in a lot of stuff into that answer. But you, you sure can talk. And you answered a lot of the questions that I would have asked you. But now I have something in the show that I call inappropriate questions. Okay, cool. I get someone that you know to ask you three questions and they can be anything. <laughs> Now, there is a time limit on the answer. So with each question, you can't go through a full year of your life where you have 19 things go wrong. But you can answer these questions. Anna Siegel is the person who's asking them. And Anna is a great oh friend God. of yours. She might be arguably the greatest Jewish skier ever. And we are going to jump into her first question. So Mode is always carrying around either a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. And whenever she has tea, it's always the smooth move tea. So I just want her to explain to us why she loves smooth move tea so much. That's so cute. It's actually an insight that we have, her and I, when we were in Japan. So <laughs> when I'm in Japan, I'm going to be very blunt on this. When I'm in Japan, I get so constipated. So tea, the smooth, smooth tea is because first it tastes really good. But it also helps digestive system. This is why, and I would always make fun of the smooth, smooth. So it's like a smooth movement. Like a, my podcast is a bowel movement, kind of like a bowel movement. I think it all ties together there. We're going to go with question number two from Anna Siegel. So I just want to know who has been her best skier bro smooch, i.e. make out. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you have to answer it. It's kind of like the rule. I don't mind. I'm so open with things like that. I really don't care. I didn't really kiss a lot of skiers. That's the thing. Well, I went out with Chris Logan. Yes. And who did I kiss? See, I don't even know. Like Austin Ross when I was super young. Well, Anna had a list of like eight people, but I'm not going to read them on the podcast. And that's a total lie. She didn't have a list at all of any people. She was just asking the question. Who was the list? Can I know? That was all a lie. She has no list. She was just asking and it sounded like you answered it. It sounded like it was Chris Logan and Austin Ross. Chris Logan has been to this house. Austin Ross has not. But we will go with Anna's final inappropriate question. Okay. So I've been to Japan with Mode a couple of times. And on the outside, she's a very open person and loves talking about all things sex and loves making me feel awkward when that comes up. But when we went in the onsen, she became a complete prude. And I just want to ask her why she was so shy to get naked with me in the onsen in Japan. Wait a second. When it comes to sex, I have a big game. I love talking about it. I love talking about experiences. I'm so open, but I'm not in the onsen to have sex, right? So when I'm in the onsen, I don't know why. It made me so uncomfortable to be with a friend naked i don't know how europeans too when i would go to austria europeans are all naked in saunas with their family i feel so uncomfortable i don't know why i have nothing to be ashamed of i'm not scared of my body or anything i just feel uncomfortable to be naked with anna and just talk with her and so it was kind of funny we would get all at that for sure. It would be way more uncomfortable with Anna than with your family, though, don't you think? Like if it was mom, dad, Frank, and you in the sauna naked with oh Anna? God. I would pick Anna for sure, a hundred percent. But you know, with some of my friends, we do have tanning session naked and we're all naked. I don't know why. The unsen is so like delicate and it just made me uncomfortable. I don't know why. I will say You've had an amazing career. It's kind of like you've done skiing your own way. Like you kind of experimented with diving and took it to like the highest level to the point where you probably bummed out some coaches that you didn't go any further. But then you jumped right into skiing and you were like, were able to be a success right away. Like I said, it, it's all kind of based on style. And that's what you might not have focused on. You were just doing things that felt good to you. 
but the way that you make skiing look, the way that your brother makes skiing look, it meant that you didn't have to win contests. You just had to produce this content that people wanted to see, which was something that not too many other women were delivering. They might have had better tricks than you, but they weren't able to deliver even basic tricks oozing the style that you were able to do. And that's what a lot of people will pay for. And you know what? Better than that, I did that with no budget because no one believed in it. So that was time with Mode Raymond, and I can't believe the amount of injuries that she has had. If I were her, I would have quit a long time ago. I mean, it's not like she had a really lucrative career in skiing, but she did have so much pain. And when I look at it, was it worth it? I didn't really get to ask Mode that question, which is okay. But looking at her career, there were a few things that I would have done differently. And sure, it's really easy to be a backseat driver in this situation. But first and foremost, when I look at her career, I would have taken a lot longer to get healthy in between injuries. Sure, maybe the first one I would have come back too soon and gotten hurt again, but then I would have realized that I need to get my body to 100% every time because I'm a professional athlete and I need to participate on that level. But Mode seemed like she wanted it so bad that she rushed things and kept getting hurt again and again. It was a cycle. And then when she finally was healthy and had a chance at an Olympic run, she skipped a contest. And sure, she was taking J.F. Poussin's advice, but why not do what you were planning on doing, get a little bit more contest experience, and then continue on with the Olympic qualifiers, like all the other girls are doing. It's such a bummer when you shoot yourself in the foot like that, but that's life and sometimes life sucks. But over the years, Mode Raymond's life hasn't sucked. Sure, there has been injuries, but no matter what injuries come her way, Mode always powers through them. That is the podcast for this week. I want to thank you for listening. I want to ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on. And when you do review me, you'll be entered into the review of the week contest. And if you win that, you'll get yourself a free Powell Movement beanie from the good folks at Cole Headwear. I am going to read you this week's review of the week. And it comes from Izzy1153. The title of the review is All the Questions We Never Got to Ask, and it is five stars. And here's the review. I don't believe I've had this as a review of the week before, but if I have, whatever, I like it. I'm going to do it again. If you are even remotely into skiing, this is a rabbit hole that you want to fall into. Powell levels well-researched questions into fanboy conversations that unmask the inner world of our sports heroes. From geeking out with ski manufacturers going to the Hanankam or reliving the stumpy days and crew, the tie that binds us is a strong one. And Mike charts that thread expertly. Well, thank you very much for that review, Izzy. It is that easy. All you need to do is head on over to the podcast icon on your iPhone, hit that, then you're going to search for the Powell Movement. You'll see my logo. You're going to click my logo. After you click it, you scroll all the way down to where you see five stars. You click five stars, you can write a review in there as well. And if you do, you'll be entered into the review of the week contest. If you win like Izzy did this week, I will not only read your review on the podcast, but I will send you a beanie. So Izzy, reach out to me at mike at thepowellmovement.com. I appreciate you taking the time to write the review and I will make sure that you get a beanie. I also need to thank my amazing sponsors who make this podcast happen. They are Stanley, the 10 Barrel Brewery. Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Weed Maps, and Elon Skis. Have a great week, everyone.